So late.
Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, when everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, cause he's never
morning. Whoa, that was such a nice good morning. Uh, welcome here. And uh, we're going to do something a little bit different. Uh, if you guys want to stand up and look at your neighbor, I know, shocker, and say good morning. You can even shake hands. Okay, now that's enough. No more, no more being friendly. Just kidding. <laughs> um, we're going to start this morning um, off with uh, prayer before we start our, our singing. So let's uh, bow our heads. Father God, we come before you with open hearts and open minds to receive what you have for us this morning. We thank you for all you've done, and we're grateful that you are bigger than all our circumstances. Father God, we give you the glory and honor that is due your name. We lift you up this morning, and we welcome the Holy Spirit here. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.
Sorry, I've got old eyes and I'm having a problem seeing my fingers. <laughs> All right, let's do it. <laughs>
Yes, Father, we lift your name on high. You are the creator of heaven and earth. You are worthy of all of our worship. God, we thank you for everything that you have given us. We thank you for your love that hung on the cross, that did not stay in the grave. God, we thank you. We worship you for who you are. The God who loves us. The God who has a plan for our lives. The God who walks with us through every situation. God, we ask that you would show us your love. Lord, in the, in the days and weeks ahead, we ask that you would show us where you are in our lives. In the, in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of, of hard times, God, we ask that you would open our eyes to see where you are. That our eyes could stay fixed on you. That our eyes would be above the waves of circumstance. And we would have our confidence and our faith in your provision and your plans. God, we thank you for who you are. Amen. You may be seated. Hey, good morning, World Back Church. Welcome here this morning. It's great to see you. Starting tonight at 7 o'clock in Sun City is Girls Ministry Bible Study Night. Join us for a fun night of studying the word together. Tomorrow, Monday night, is the women's Bible study, which is taking place in the lower level of this building. As well, Tuesday is the men's ministry Bible study, which also takes place in the lower level of this building. Today is also the last day to sign up for the IF gathering. Doesn't just have to be for the women of our church, we are wanting this to be for the women of Nipperville and the community abroad. We want this to be an opportunity to come together to learn about Jesus and to be one body. And today we're starting our envelope fundraising campaign for Youth Quake. For those of you who don't know, our senior youth has been doing service nights throughout the year and part of the reward for doing that is going to Youth Quake. Youth Quake is a big youth conference weekend event at Briarcrest Bible College in Saskatchewan. We're really excited to take our youth there. But with that comes some costs. So we have 100 envelopes. In those envelopes is a number between one and 100. There is not more than one of each number. So all that will happen is you can take an envelope, you'll have a number between one and 100, and we ask that you donate that amount. I just wanna thank you in advance for sewing into our senior youth ministry. This is an amazing opportunity that our senior youth have to be surrounded by believers of the same age to spend a weekend worshiping God and learning more about him. I know personally, I'm really excited for the fruit that's gonna come from this weekend. Thank you for joining us today. Well, good morning. Thank you, worship team, for leading us. I'm going to do something I don't generally do uh, for fear of embarrassing people, but why not? I'm going to just introduce, without embarrassing her at all, actually, the, the young lady that was standing here. I'm sure some of you are going, who is that young lady with that great voice that has joined our worship team? This is the second time she's joined our team. That is Skylar Funk. And uh, she was part of the youth program many moons ago when I was doing that. And uh, her brother Cole plays guitar on one of the worship teams. And so she has asked to be involved. And so anyway, didn't they all do a great job this morning, the three ladies? In those, oh, and the gentlemen. And the gentleman, so, so uh, that's who she was, so if you see her in the foyer afterwards, you'll know her name and you can thank her for serving us in, in that way uh, this morning. We're going to get into the Word of God this morning. Prior to our Palm Sunday and Easter services, I had started a series on the history of God's people joining together, and we started in Haggai, and this was uh, way back in the first weekend in February, and we were, I called it a build my church series based on Jesus words in Matthew upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not stand or prevail against it and this morning the title of the message is characteristics of the early church and really this should be just called characteristics of the church 
Because the church that was started at the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out is still the church that we are a part of today. The ongoing work of Christ in the world, bringing people to himself and, and having lives transformed is still ongoing and we are part of that early church. And the characteristics that marked the early church we're going to see are still a part of today's church. Okay, so we looked at Moses and the tent of meeting. Just to catch up, anyone, if you're visiting, and uh, so we started in Haggai and went back and well, all the way back to Moses, the tent of meeting, and the Holy Spirit was, uh, he t- God told Moses to build this tent of meeting, this tabernacle, and that the Spirit of God would fill it and dwell in it, and so that's what they did. Then we looked at Solomon's temple, same thing. Solomon's temple was built and was designed for the presence of God because God has always wanted to be in relationship and in fellowship with His people. And we're going to see that all the way through here. So uh, then uh, we ended up in the book of Acts, or in New Testament book of Acts, as we became, as we become the temple that God would dwell in through His Holy Spirit. And the birth of the church, as we know it, that happened on the day of Pentecost, and that was two weeks ago, we talked about that, and we talked about uh, how the Spirit was poured out, and people were gathered, and they started speaking in tongues and other languages, and the people that were there could hear the gospel message from people who didn't know their language, but in their own language. Uh, incredible. And if you're uh, curious about pray, uh, praying in tongues, we looked, we looked into that. If you're the prayer of tongues and the different things, that you can tune in or go back to our church website and check out that message if you want information on that. But on the day of Pentecost, when they were speaking in tongues, they were speaking other languages that the people could understand and hear the gospel. And so that's where we were two weeks ago. This morning, again, looking at from Matthew's gospel upon this rock, the revelation knowledge that Jesus is the Messiah. They'd been waiting for a Messiah, and lots of people didn't see Jesus as the Messiah. But upon that rock, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior of the world, I will build my church and will not stand against it. The gates of hell will not prevail against it, in fact. This morning, we're going to turn our attention to the early church as a result of the day of Pentecost and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So you can turn in Acts chapter 2 is where we're going to be this morning, and you can follow along with me, because I want to start right after this happened... Peter, it says he stood up and preached a message, and so I'm going to not read the whole thing, but I'm going to read chunks of it, and it will be on the screen behind me so you can follow along so you'll know where I'm jumping to, but it starts in Acts chapter 2, verse 14, but just prior to this was when all this stuff was happening, the Holy Spirit's poured out, and this amazed and perplexed because they could hear people speaking, sharing the truth of Jesus in their own language. Amazed and perplexed. That's not on the screen. I lied to you. This part's not there. (laughs) They asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Now, Peter's sermon. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And if you want to know what the prophet Joel said, you can read it there, but we're jumping to verse 22. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you, Through him, as you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now See and hear. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, that would be us, for all whom the Lord 
our God will call. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So after the Holy Spirit was poured out, this was the message that Peter stood up and preached. And 3,000 were added to their number that day. And I don't know how you feel about megachurches, but the first church was a megachurch. That may not sit well <laughs> with you for some reason. I don't know why that wouldn't sit well with you. The church is a megachurch worldwide, and it's continuing to grow daily, those who are being saved and called by God. But the story doesn't end here. I want to look this morning at the fruit that was produced at the birth of the New Testament church. And for that, we're going to read a little bit further in Acts chapter 2, just verses 42 to 47. They devoted themselves, they were baptized, they were added to the number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And again, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Wow. That's impressive. That's a church growth manual right there. The things to do to be a New Testament church. The fire didn't fade or go out, and it's still burning today. It begs the question for us, looking at this and reading this, what did the early church do that we still do? What did the early church do that we maybe no longer do? And are there things that the modern church is doing that the early church didn't do? And I'm not even going to touch that one, just so you know, up front. Not this morning, anyway. So I want to cover these verses in uh, greater detail this morning. Yes, things have changed since. Instead of one visible Christian church meeting place, there are now many. But the characteristics required to have a healthy, growing church family are still the same. And characteristic number one was they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, the word devoted implies much more than simply they gathered around and listened. They were devoted to the teachings of the apostles. Now, the apostles would have been teaching the Torah, the, the, the Old Testament law. They would have been teaching the prophets and Psalms and the life and ministry of Jesus Christ and how everything taught in the law and the prophets lined up with Jesus being actually the Messiah that they had been waiting for. So they devoted themselves to this teaching. Some of it requiring them to look back into the law and understand how Jesus became the fulfillment of it. The word devoted, though, implies so much more than just hearing. It was important to them. They listened with understanding that even if what was taught if it was difficult, that they were ready to apply the teaching to their lives. When I say devoted to the apostles' teaching, and we read that now, I'm talking about for us as a church that we need to be devoted to the Word of God, the apostles' teaching. We are fortunate enough to have the scriptures in print, which include the life and ministry of Jesus, plus the apostles' teachings. And we need to be devoted to them. Devoted to the Word of God, devoted to these teachings, means 
it is the standard by which we want to live our lives. Even though today's day and age, a lot of it seems or is offensive and countercultural. A lot of people, uh, not a lot of people, I've, I've spoken to people before that would say they feel that it would have been easier in, for the early church to preach the gospel and these teachings than it is for us because we have all of these opposing views and access to so much more information that we are coming against way more, you would think we are coming against way more opposition. But here's why I think that's not true. I think the early church had it harder because we, yes, have a message that is countercultural. But the early church leaders also had a message that was countercultural. But not only that, it was counter to the way they had been raised in Judaism. So not only were they preaching to the lost, which we do, they were preaching to those who had grown up knowing God, praying faithfully going to the temple religiously, and then saying a message to them that says all these things <laughs> that you've practiced and believed forever are changing. They would have been telling people about the sacrifice Jesus made when the system of, of forgiveness of sin was based on the sacrifice of animals. They would have been hearing that the Holy Spirit has been poured out and you can be filled with the Spirit, and the Spirit of God is going to live in you, they're saying this to a group of people that recognized that the Spirit of God lived in the Holy of Holies in the inner sanctuary in the temple. And they were afraid of it, Him. They were afraid of the Holy Spirit. Way back when we looked at the tent of meeting, they want Moses, you go up the mountain. We don't want to, we don't want to be anywhere near the presence of God. And they're coming with this gospel message that says the sacrificial system no longer needed. The Holy of Holies, the priest going once a year, no no longer. We now have access to the very presence of God. And we look at that as an honor and a privilege. And we understand, wow, we can stand here or at home and just pray and be in the presence and bring our petitions right to the Lord. And we are honored and privileged to do that. These people that they're talking to in the early church... This is foreign and scary. So I think the early church had it harder than we do. But when it comes back to the idea of being devoted to the apostles' teaching and being devoted to the Word of God, think of it in terms of someone who is a fan of a sports team. Right? I like watching sports once in a while, but I'm not devoted to it. There are certain people, you know, and could be you, when you're devoted to a sports team, you are devoted through the good seasons and the bad. They are your team. You might be mad. You might learn some new language, some words. But you're devoted, or you've got those people that are just like myself, who are not following closely, that might just jump on the bandwagon of whichever team is doing the best. I don't do that because I don't have an interest. But, for example, I'm a fan of are Winnipeg Blue Bombers. But it's been easy to be a fan of the Blue Bombers the last few years because they are doing so well. I'm going to those games with my son, and we're walking out of there most times in a great mood. Even if they lose, we're so good in the standings, it's easy to cheer for them. I'm a devoted fan right now. What will it look like? (laughs) How will it look like? Will I want to spend the money on the season tickets if they're losing all the time? Think about this for a minute. The Winnipeg Blue Bombers went from 1990 till to 2019 without winning the Grey Cup. That's almost 30 years of devoted fans. Now they're doing so well in the last number of years that the stadium is sold out almost every game, unless the weather's bad. And it's fun. But when you're devoted to something, it's through good and bad, and it's through devotion to the Word of God when we agree with it and when it doesn't agree with what we want to do. We still have devotion to it, devoted to it. An hour a week of being taught from the Scriptures cannot be considered devotion to the Word of God. 
Coming here on Sunday and hearing a good message based on Scripture is not being devoted to the Word of God. You've got to have time in the Word of God if you're devoted to it. This is great that you come. Please continue to come. (laughs) Continue to watch from home. But devotion implies much more than just hearing a message, thinking about it, and walking out. The early believers were in the Word at every opportunity. The Word of God uh, is a core value here, according to the sign. (laughs) The teachings of the apostles and of Jesus are often difficult. They're countercultural, but they are the truth. And I would rather stand here and preach the Word of God and the truth, even if it's offensive in some ways, because people need to know the truth. They don't need to feel good. They need the truth. And the Holy Spirit being poured out, one of the jobs or responsibilities of the Holy Spirit is to lead and guide us into truth. When you spend time in the Word of God, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what He's saying to you in the passages that you're reading and spend time with the Lord. Characteristic number two is they devoted themselves to fellowship. Three times in these six verses, the word together is used, plus the word fellowship, which implies togetherness. So essentially, four times in six verses, the idea of being together is mentioned. And it says they not only gathered together, they were devoted to one another. There was a love and sincere caring for each other. There was a loyalty to their brothers and sisters in Christ. A love and loyalty that led to actions of selflessness. Here's the four times it's mentioned. It says they devoted themselves to fellowship. They were together and had everything in common. I'm going to touch on that in a few minutes. Every day they continued. Every day. Every day. (laughs) They continued to meet together in the temple courts. This ended about 1988. Just kidding. And no, no old churchgoers in the 80s? Church every day, it was like, that's how I grew up. It was like crazy. Wow. You might not be saved if you didn't experience that. I'm kidding. Anyway, every day. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, and then they broke bread and ate together in their homes. Now, there are people, and the idea has been floated around for years, that we don't really need to gather the way we do on a Sunday morning in a building like this. Hey, the early church... Did not have buildings like this. And if we want to be like the early church, we shouldn't be meeting. People believe we shouldn't be meeting like this. Instead, we should be meeting in homes because that's what they did in the early church. They have this idea. But the people that are strong proponents of just meeting in homes are only strong proponents of that aspect of what the early church did. And it's usually because... They just don't want to go to church. They've met Christians, and they didn't like the ones they were associated with, and they, don't, they just don't want to go to church. They're not strong proponents of selling everything they have and having everything in common. They're happy to stay home and be a part of a small church group in a home, but the other aspects, they don't kind of push those quite as heavily. It says that the early church seemed to I mean, the early church seemed to look for ways to be together. And they were dedicated to it. They were together in the temple courts and in their homes. They were dedicated, they were in their, they were together in the temple courts and in their homes. Their dedication to fellowship became a way of life for them. As a church, our Christian fellowship has to go beyond having coffee Sunday morning in the foyer. <laughs> has to go beyond that if we're going to be devoted to fellowship. If we're going to be devoted to one another, it's more than just, hi, it's, it's connecting with one another. It's caring about one another. One of the reasons the early church met in homes was because they didn't have buildings yet. A lot of people might, you might feel that 
this wasn't God's design, that the church has gone way off track of what God had in mind. Listen, Jesus said himself, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And the church has morphed and moved, and we have eight churches in our community. Other buildings like this gathering to worship God. And some would say, well, why do we have that many churches? Because it's just a matter of different worship styles, different uh, preferences, different things for our family involvement that we, that we choose and like. But we're all the same. We're all filled with the Holy Spirit. We are all the church. But I believe it's important that we gather together to be devoted to one another so that we can get to know one another better. We can be accountable to one another, which leads me to characteristic number three. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. This idea of breaking bread together is mentioned twice in six verses. Breaking of bread has a double meaning here. First of all, it refers to the communion and remembering the Lord's Supper, the Holy ordinances of the church. Remember, Peter stood up and said, they said, what should we do? And he said, repent and be baptized. The holy ordinance of the early church or the holy ordinances of the church were practiced from the beginning and are still practiced. Repent and be baptized. They broke bread together, recognizing communion and the Lord's Supper. But it also means that they were literally just eating together. It refers to Spending time with people and breaking bread. Those who had plenty and those who were poor, they would gather together and it didn't matter who brought what, but nobody was going to leave hungry because it didn't matter about your social status. It didn't matter anymore about your possessions. What mattered was that we are looking after one another because we are devoted to one another and we are breaking bread together. So no one would leave the meeting hungry or in need. It's a beautiful picture of the church. Breaking bread together implies a closeness, the sharing of food. And food is, is necessary. Food is a big deal to God. Look at the life and ministry of Jesus. He fed 4,000 people plus more than one occasion. He enjoyed a last meal with his disciples on the night he was going to be in the garden and be betrayed. After he rose from the dead, he made breakfast for the disciples on the beach. And when we think about heaven and going to heaven, we know, and it is referred to as the marriage feast of the Lamb that we are looking forward to because food from the very beginning was important to God. In fact, it was food on the tree of knowledge that got us into trouble in the first place. Characteristic number four says they were devoted to prayer. So a simple question, how is your prayer life? It's rhetorical, don't yell out, it's awesome. (laughs) It's lacking, forgive me. (laughs) How is your prayer life? We list prayer as a core value. In fact, if you look at these things in the early church and you relate them to our five core values, they're the same. So if you're concerned, like the early church was different, we are doing all these things that the early church did. They don't look exactly the same. I'll show you how they are, though, in a minute. With the, with the one that seems different, the generosity and giving, we'll get to that in a minute. But still, they were devoted to prayer. Uh, <laughs> we list prayer as a core value. We provide corporate prayer times. At almost every single function we have as a group, there is prayer involved because it's important. If the office is open, you're welcome to come here. I'll put the lights on for you. You're welcome to come in here and spend some time with the Lord if you didn't have space with privacy at home or whatever. You're welcome here. You can meet with friends and pray here. If you need to have a sensitive conversation with some friends, you want to talk about something, you need uh, prayer, but the coffee shops in town are a little bit close and everyone can kind of hear one another, Grab your coffee and come here. Find a space and talk and pray with one another. The church is open for you. The door will be locked, but the office side is open. We'll let you in. (laughs) He said it was open. We'll let you in. (laughs) 
You can join us at early morning prayer if that works with your schedule. But that's not an indicator of what your prayer life is like. I'd be scared if it was. <laughs> that's not an indicator of what your prayer life Are you devoted to prayer? Do you wake up with it on your mind that you're going to thank God for the day, pray for your family and your extended church family, your brothers and sisters? Characteristic number five. We're not going to get through all of these because, well, I'll tell you in a minute. Characteristic number five is generosity and giving. And I'm going to read verse 44 and, and, and 45 again because uh, this is good stuff. All the believers were together and had everything in common. <laughs> they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Think about that. <laughs> Now, most of the people who are pushing that the idea of church is antiquated and we shouldn't do it are not really pushing this idea a whole lot. And to the lazy person, <laughs> to the underachievers, this sounds pretty sweet. It's like project-based learning. If you don't do any of the work on the project, it's ideal. Sounds awesome. Doesn't sound as awesome to the entrepreneur, entrepreneur, sorry, the business owner, the wealthy individuals seated around. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. I don't want to. We've seen how taxes work. It's frustrating. I'm not selling everything. Are you kidding me? A lazy bum can get a job. Well, I got good news. That's not entirely what it means. You don't have to sell your stuff. So what do we do? What is the correct response to these verses? Let me explain, and then we're going to move into something else, and I'll finish this sermon in a couple of weeks. Anyway, first of all, <laughs> the church and the believers still do this today. We still do this today. We still give, pool our resources, and help those in need. Always have, always will. After our building and salaries, the number one thing we do as a church is give to missions. The largest budget line on our annual budget after salaries and church maintenance stuff is missions. Giving it away. Getting the gospel to places that they may not hear it otherwise. Supporting people who are willing to go and we are wanting to help them by selling some of what we have or giving what we have so that they can go into those places that we can't or God hasn't called us to. But we are a part of it because we give and share in that. We teach tithing or giving 10% here. The reason behind that, not only is it a biblical principle, but it is a level playing field. The wealthiest person here give 10% and the poorest person here give 10%. They've given the same amount of sacrifice. We have all things in common. And having all things in common doesn't mean that... I always read these verses and I pictured, you know, everyone sold all their stuff. They brought it in and had this big pile of money that was just accessible to everyone. That's not what it means. It's more like living on my street. There's a number of us on the street. We're friends... Uh, and every one of us has a snowblower, a lawnmower, a pressure washer, a tiller, uh, all of the things you need for yard care. All of us have it. Having all things in common would have been me getting together with my neighbors and saying, hey, why don't we put a shed here and we'll have a snowblower and a lawnmower. And it's having all things. When I need it, it's available. That's what the church looks like, or should. Not that we all have one snowblower and we're all going to... I don't mean in those particular items, but what I mean is in the sense of that attitude towards, hey, when we gather, you have need, I, I, I can help with that need. You can help with something I might have need of. And that's why it's important, or one of the reasons it's important, that we gather like this. Uh, 
In this way, whether you're wealthy or not, the sacrifice will be the same. I've said it before, Niverville is a very generous community, and you are an extremely generous church. So do not take any condemnation. This is not a message on giving. I'm not trying to pump you up to dig deeper. You are a generous congregation, and we are giving where needs are being met, and you should be honored to be a part of that because you are. Uh, Here's the thing. When I read that, I always get this mixed-up picture of what that goes. It goes on to say that they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, or one translation says, in singleness of heart. They broke bread in their homes. The church members devoted to each other should be open-handed and open-hearted. Now, we are not obligated by Scripture here to sell our homes and our possessions and give it away. But we are to be willing to if God were to require that of us. And listen, if God is requiring that of you, you make sure you are hearing from God and not a well-meaning pastor, not some prophet you prescribe to. Make sure you are hearing from God before you make any drastic life change like that. Because He will speak to you. He would speak clearly to you. If He's asking you to sell and head to the mission field, you will know. And if that's something you're interested in, let us know. We want to support you. Look at the story of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5 for homework. Uh, And Peter says what happened was Ananias and Sapphira sold their stuff, and they told God and and the apostles that they sold it for a certain amount, but they lied. They actually sold it for more and kept some back. Now, the problem wasn't that they kept some back. The problem was that they lied. Peter says, right to Ananias, why would you lie to the Holy Spirit? Didn't it belong to you before you sold it? It was was yours. And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? You could have just came and said, we sold this plot of land for 30,000 and we're going to give 10 because we want to invest in a different field. But they lied. That was the sin there. Not that you had to sell everything. So it's not telling us to do that. The other reason for selling their homes and possessions <laughs> was because they thought Jesus was coming right back. You know, we've had some modern day prophets, if you will, false prophets, that have said Jesus is coming back. And lots of people followed in the late 80s and 2000, the turning of the 1999, and people sold their stuff. They believed a prophet, a man. They believed it and... Sold their stuff. Same thing was happening here. Jesus is coming right back. We're not going to need these things. They're not a priority. Some people went the other way. (laughs) In the 80s and 90s, they're like, well, I'm just going to buy all new stuff and leave the debt for the devil. (laughs) That that would have been my approach. (laughs) He's coming back. Anyway, the truth is, the truth is in all of this, sorry, we are not unlike the early church. Be encouraged in that. Are we devoted to fellowship? Could we be more devoted to fellowship? Probably. Could we be more devoted to the Word, to spiritual disciplines like our communion and eating together, repenting and baptism, to prayer and to giving? Sure. But we're doing all of these things that were started after the day of Pentecost, and the church is alive and well, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And this is a recipe for a healthy church to be walking in these things and to be devoted to one another. But all of these are still ordinances that we practice. We still gather together and meet in homes. The only part that trips up the modern church is the intentionality of our devotion to it. And that requires a personal assessment. You don't need me, your pastor, standing up here and telling you, you need to pray more. You need to come to church more often. You need to be devoted to one another. You need to give more. No. All of these things, when it comes to devotion to God, the Word of God, and the things of God, is just a personal assessment. You can look at your own life and your own relationship with God, because I can't tell you you don't pray enough. How do I know when you pray? How do I know how much time you're spending? 
I don't know how much you give. I don't know how devoted you are to one another. Now, I know in a church our size that some people will sit here forever, some will sit here forever, and never the twain shall meet. That's not supposed to be the way it is. However, we have small groups. We have other ways. Be connected. If you watch via live stream only, call us. Let us know that you're still part of the church and find a way to be devoted to some people in some form. If, 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 if it's something that the larger crowd bothers you or something, whatever it is, be devoted to some brothers and sisters in Christ. Be a part of the women's ministry, the men's ministry, the youth ministry. Be a part of the prayer times, the there's just so much ways that we can be caring for and devoted to one another. And it doesn't have to look like condemnation and guilt. You've got to be here every week. Coming into summer, what are the chances? And if you leave here, <laughs> if you decide to go somewhere else, let me know. People get upset when they leave and they've been gone for a few months and the pastor didn't phone. I didn't know you were gone. Well, how did you not know? You only came three times a month anyway. How would I know? I bet there's 400 people here. I want to know. I want to be devoted to you. I want to just tell me you're leaving. Tell me you've joined. Connect. I'll be devoted to you. I haven't, we haven't gone anywhere. <laughs> For people who leave, it's like, yeah, I didn't move. You did. And I'm not mad at people who leave. There's lots of reasons to leave a church. There's people who are joining our church have left a different one for various reasons. But we want to be devoted to one another. Here's the benefit to all of us following these things. Number one, signs and wonders and miracles. They were awe inspired by the miracles and things that happen. Signs and wonders follow the preaching of the word. Okay, so we should see transformed lives. Um. Second benefit, we enjoy the favor of all the people. Man, if the church acted like the church, instead of just telling everybody what we're against, and instead told people what we are for and what we are about, and how incredible it is to serve God, how merciful and loving He is, if we actually treated one another like we loved one another, like we say we're going to do, the world would be interested in what we have to offer. They'd want to know our God. The Scriptures say it. They knew they were Christians by their love for one another. When the church and Christians actually love the way God intended us to, even outsiders will look favorably upon us. And three, it says, and the Lord will add daily to our number those who are being saved. When we follow these things, the Lord is still ministering. His, the Holy Spirit has been poured out and is, is leading people to truth. And so that's still happening. Uh, I want to take a few moments this morning. I'm going to ask... Uh, we're going to have a brief moment of prayer. For those of you watching from home, uh, there's no secret announcements. We're just having a time of prayer for a few minutes. And so I'm going to ask the live stream crew to just shut that off. You at home, God bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. See you next week. If you can join us in person, awesome.